Okay, let's get started. Hello, everyone. I want to welcome everyone to GSPC Overflow Ministry Sunday Worship. So let's go ahead and um, gather our heart and focus our mind to worship God. Please join me in prayer. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear Father God, we are standing in your presence. We take, our, take off our sandal from our feet and in our heart, for the ground we stand here is holy. Help us take off our worldly thoughts. Take us, help us take off our earthy desires. Help us take off our fear, worries, and shame. Please cover us with your spirit. Please cover us with your blood. Please cover us with your Holy Spirit. Although we are not worthy, we stand here before you because of what your son Jesus Christ has done for, for us on the cross. So now let my lips praise the name of your, uh, praise your name. Let my soul worship your name. Let everything in me praise your name. And let this time be an expression to show our love to you. The kingdom, the power, and the glory is yours forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join us in reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us continue with praise. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, please join us now in time of praise. Oh, 
Please turn your Bibles to Proverbs 2, 1 through 5. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding. If you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. The word of the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, it is our greatest desire to know you. As we cover the topic of Trinity, please help us understand who you are, that we love and worship, and use me as your instrument to deliver your message to your precious people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hello, guys. I'm so excited to share today's topic uh, with you all. Let me share my screen. Okay, so we're going to talk about the concept and uh, doctrine of Trinity. And before we begin, uh, let me just go ahead and emphasize today's Bible verse. It says, my son, if you receive my word and treasure up my commandment with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom. So if you seek out wisdom, and if you want to understand, then what's going to happen? Verse five, it said that you're going to, you will understand the fear of the Lord. And then he said, you're going to find a knowledge of God. So the purpose um, and, uh, and the goal of getting wisdom is that you're going to learn, understand the fear of the Lord. You get to understand who God is and fear God, not in a negative sense, but in a sense that you, you um, honor God, you have awe for God. And then you're gonna find the knowledge of God. So this should be a goal for us as a Christian to know God and love him. And when you look back in history, uh, Israel as a nation was chosen to be a beacon of light for our nation. So God has entrusted him and God has revealed who he is to the nation of Israel. So they have the Old Testament, the Bible. But well, what happened? They began to disobey God and uh, they ended up being punished. So they were, um, the, the nation of Israel was destroyed. The people of Israel was taken out of their homeland. They were in the exile. And Hosea tells us the reason why this is happening. Hosea 4, 6 said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge in what? 
lack of knowledge in God because you have rejected knowledge. Therefore, I will reject you from being a priest to me. These are used, used to be a priest nation. But now, since they forgot about God, they are being punished and therefore they are being destroyed. But God doesn't only tell them why they're being uh, destroyed. God also gave them a, a way to uh, restore their land. On uh, Hosea 6, it said, let us know. Let us press on to know, know the Lord. He's going out as sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the showers, as the spring rain that waters the earth. So how can you restore your nation? How can you restore your life? How can you, how can you restore uh, your spiritual life is by knowing, knowing who God is. And lastly, uh, Bible said in the last day, something's going to happen. And one of the signs is that the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of Lord as the water covers the earth, covers the sea. So um, it is clear that we are living in the last day, according to the Bible. And what's going to happen in the last day? Is the knowledge of Lord, the glory of the uh, knowledge of the Lord is going to be cover the earth. So um, you and I should, should have the full knowledge of God, uh, more and more knowledge of God, as we uh, live out our lives in the last day. Therefore, once again, knowing God should be our priority in, in our Christian life. So when, when you say um, Trinity, what exactly do we mean? So... Um, this is the essential to our Christian faith because this is somebody who we worship. So this is the God of the Bible. And um, when you begin to read the Bible, God, God has revealed himself to us in the scripture. Therefore, we begin to understand and know who God is. But who is this God in the Bible? God described um, in the Bible as a tri triune God. So once again, Trinity is very essential and identity of who our God is. But um, when we try to understand or describe Trinity, it's kind of hard. So it is important to be able to articulate the Trinity if you believe in it. Because if somebody were to ask you what, what the Trinity is, how would you answer the question? Most people would say, um, I believe Trinity to be three in one. This is a correct answer, but um, there is something more beyond it because what is three in one mean? It's God a shampoo because shampoo is three in one too. So uh, once again, if you uh, believe something, you have to be able to describe what it is. You have to be able to articulate what it is because uh, be able to explain what you believe. Um, otherwise, you don't know what you actually believe in you don't actually believe it. That, does, that means that you don't actually believe it. You want to believe it. You want to believe God. You want to believe the Bible, but you just don't know what to believe. Therefore, the point is, if you truly believe God of the Bible, then you have to be able to explain to others what it is. You have to be able to articulate it, okay? So hopefully this uh, will be a blessing time to you as we cover the topic of Trinity. So here's what we're going to cover today. So first, we're going to cover, we're going to talk about some objection to Trinity. Uh, surprisingly, there are a lot of different thoughts and religion who oppose to the concept of Trinity. So we're going to cover some of the objections. And number two, we're going to finally talk about what the Trinity is. And I will show you the Trinity in the New Testament. But not only that, I'll show you the Trinity in the Old Testament as well. And finally, we're going to talk about how we should apply this knowledge to our own life, okay? So please go ahead and put on your thinking cap, concentrate, and then try to uh, learn who our God is, okay? So let's get into an objection. So um, people who object to the concept of Trinity, once again, there's a tons of people, you name it, uh, Jehovah's Witness, Mormons, or Muslim, even, even Jewish people, uh, they all deny that uh, God is triune God. Some people, like uh, Jewish people, they believe God of the Old Testament, but at the same time, they deny God is triune God. And uh, their number one objection is the word Trinity does not appear in the Bible. It's not mentioned in the Bible. And this is true. 
And, uh, and the, when you look at the Old Testament, it said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, the God is one. And once again, this is true. And even in the New Testament, it's clearly said that one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and, and in all. So both Old and New Testament clearly um, said that God is one. And this is also true. We do believe in one God. But here's a problem. How can three be one? We all confess that we believe in one God. But what about the Trinity, a concept of Trinity? How can three be one? So, um, um, for example, there can not be a such thing as a square circle. Um, if you say three is one, then is this a logical contradiction? So let's look into the, uh, these objections. And of course, uh, contradiction cannot be true as well. So, so how can God be three? Here goes. So Father uh, is God, and then Holy Spirit is God, and then Jesus is God. So do we believe in three God? That's the question, right? Is Christianity polytheistic religion? Poly means many, theistic means God. So do we believe in many God? So of course we don't believe that, right? So here's the, uh, now the concept of Trinity. I'm gonna explain to you. According to the Bible, God is one in being and three in person. So once again, God is one in being and three in person. So therefore, right off the bat, it's not a contradiction. We're not comparing apple to apple. We're comparing apple to orange. So it's not a contradiction. If you say God is one being and three in being, now that's a contradiction because you're comparing the, the two same thing. But our God is not one being and three being at the same time. Therefore, it's not a contradiction. He's one being and then the three person. Now the question is, what's the difference between being and a person? So let me explain to you. Being is this quality or essence or substance that makes you what you are. And the person is this quality or essence or substance that make you who you are. So being touch on the subject of what, and then person is about who. So for example, let me give you an explanation. What kind of being am I? I am a human being, but who am I as a person? I am a Christian limb. This is my person. So the two are not the same thing. Being in a person is not the same thing. We all share the types of being we are. We're all human being, you and I. Everyone's a human being. But none of, none of you share the kind of person I am. I'm Christian Lim. You are Rebecca, teacher JTS, Sulam, and so forth. You are a different person. So um, all humans are... Uh, as a human, we are one type of being with one person. I am a human being and I'm Christian Lim. That's it. I'm not a, any other person. But our God is one type of being, God. But he's three person, the Father, Son, and Spirit. So uh, is there anything like that on earth? Uh, answer is no. Some people try to explain Trinity by, uh, uh, by using a water. You know, they explain sometimes water is a liquid. But when it's cold, it's, a, it's a ice. And when it's hot, it becomes a um, vaporized, right? So people try to say, therefore, God is like the water or ice or, or, or the mist. But that's, that's not a right, um, I guess, analogy because it's not like God changes form. Sometimes it's father, but uh, he changes form to a son and changes form to a spirit. Just like water changes form to a liquid to, to an ice. It's like God changes here and now his form. All at the same time, God is Father, Son, and Spirit. Therefore, the uh, ice analogy is not actually a correct one. So once again, there's nothing like, like that on the earth. But does that mean God cannot be one being at the end of three person at the same time? No, God is almighty. If God is one being and three person, that's who he is. That's not a logical contradiction. So that is our God. And uh, scripture tells us that we can know God by observing the nature. So people don't need a Bible to know who God is. So Romans 1, 19 said, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. 
for his in invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. So once again, no one has an ex excuse. Even though you don't know Jesus, you don't know the Bible, everybody knows that there is God by observing, observing the nature. You know, nature cannot create it itself. So there must be a creator. People intuitively know there is a God. However, there's deeper things about God who is like trying nature of God. He can only be known to us by God reveal, reveal himself to us through the scripture. So um, when we read the Bible, this framework help us understand who, who God is and, and the person of God. And once again, his role. I said it's role because um, according to the Bible, Father is God, Son is God, Spirit is God, but they're not each other. So Son is not the Father, Father is not the Spirit, and Spirit is not the Son. So this is the concept of Trinity. And let's talk about one more objection. If they're all God, let's say Jesus is God, you know, Father is God, Holy Spirit is God, within a one being, they're not separate God, but they're one being. Then why did Jesus say, Father is greater than I? Doesn't this imply that Jesus is not God? Because God, God, Jesus cannot be the same level as Father if he's not, um, you know, um, God. So why did Jesus say, Father is greater than I? Let me explain to you um, by giving you this illustration. How can Jesus be God if the Father is greater than he? So imagine there is a CEO um, of a company and he's in charge of everything in the corporation. And there's a new intern who just got hired for maybe a month and he's just in charge of doing a one task. What's the difference between the CEO and the new intern? And what's the similarity? In terms of a, B, uh, in terms of a role, CEO has a greater role. CEO has a much to do with the company than an intern who's gonna be there for only a short time. So their role is different. But what kind of being are they? They're both human beings. In terms of a status of a, as a human being, they're same. Therefore, uh, within the triune God, Jesus and God is the same being. They're both God, not a separate God, but one God. However, the role is different. Role as a father is different from the son. That, that's why Jesus said, Father is greater than I. You guys understand? So um, father is a divine being. Jesus is a divine being, Holy Spirit is a divine being, but difference in role. So Jesus, as a son, take on the role as a son to die on the cross for our sin. And God as a father, is a greater role as a father to send his son to die us on the cross. So now let's talk about the Trinity in the uh, New Testament. This is uh, pretty easy because we found it in the, all over the New Testament. For example, Matthew, when Jesus was baptized, um, he saw the Spirit of God descending like dove coming to the rest on Jesus. And there was a voice in heaven said, Behold, uh, this is my beloved Son, with whom I'm, I am well pleased. So there is a Trinity. So once again, the word Trinity does not appear in the Bible. However, it, Trinity is just a word that we use to describe the trial nature of God, which is clear, clearly um, written in the Bible. So there is a Jesus, there is a Spirit. And there is Father God speaking out of heaven at the same time. And once again, when Jesus gave us the great commission, he gave us uh, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So once again, there is a clear description of triune God in the New Testament. So once again, no one objects that there is a Trinity in the New Testament. Not the word, but the concept. But many people say, isn't Trinity a concept that is made up by the Christian? Because no Jews believe in it. Uh, you, you don't find Trinity in the Old Testament. So that's one of the objections uh, of Trinity. So where is the evidence of Trinity in the Old Testament? So let's look at a few evidence. First of all, God, uh, Bible talks about the plural, plurality of God. Uh, let me explain to you what I mean. Um, where do you begin to see a trinity in the Old Testament? You'll find that in the first book, in the first chapter, in the first Bible verse. So it said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But when you look at this sentence in the original language, in the Hebrew uh, word, 
the word God is Elohim, but this is a plural form of God. So the singular God in Hebrew means El. So Israel, Ishmael, the, it means God. Gabriel, God is uh, with me. El means God. But Elohim is a plural form of God. It means God's in a literal sense. But here's uh, what's interesting. The verb created, treat as if Elohim is a singular. So there's a uh, Bible described that there's gods, but this God is not a plural God. It's a singular God. This God created in a singular form. And um, again, in Genesis number one, uh, chapter one, God said, let us in a plural form make men in our image after our likeness. So um, here's a question. Who is God speaking to if he's all by himself when he's trying to create, you know, man and other, other creation? And why does God call himself in a plural form? If you don't understand the concept of Trinity, this is, this is mystery. And some people argue that this is just a majestic plural, meaning that, you know, English, there is actually a term called majestic plural that uh, if you're a... Um, if you're a king, if you're a high person, you call yourself as in a plural form. There's a royal we. Like king of England or queen of England, she calls herself we or I. But the problem is the Hebrew language doesn't have any uh, majestic plural. So this is a, a false explanation. So the Bible clearly shows that God describes himself in a plural way, but at the same time, it's, it's very clear to us that God is one. Let's move on. Okay, in the objection, I told you that in the Old Testament, uh, uh, Jewish people confessed that hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, right? But then again, in this sentence, once again, this is actually a call a Shema prayer. And every Jewish people, this is the central prayer uh, in their worship. Uh, Shema Israel, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Ehad. So this is the prayer they, they pray to God every time they worship God. But this word one, ehad, doesn't mean one in a, in a numerical sense. The word ehad is something, uh, for example, you say a grape is one, one grape, but, right? But the grape is consists of many different things. And you could find this word ehad used use the, throughout the Bible in this different sense. Let me give you a, two examples. Number one. When God uh, created the light, uh, he said, God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning. The first day, and the word here first is ehad. So you called night and day, the two different things. And you, you're going to call this a day, one, one day, first day, ehad. So once again, this word one was used to describe something that's, that is combined together. And then the next example it said, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. So when you get married, you're going to leave your parents and the man and the husband is going to become one body. And the Bible described this one as ehad again. So two different things, plural things become one is ehad. Okay, so now let's actually look into some Bible passage describe the concept of Trinity, especially in the Old Testament. So according to the Bible, there is no doubt that um, you know, only God is our Savior. God is the only one who saves. Isaiah 43, 11 said, I'm the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. So this is very clear. And Bible also said, there's only one being who is God can forgive sins. Isaiah 43, once again, 25 said, I am he who blot out your transgression, your sin, for my own sake, and I will not remember your sin. So God can only, only God can forgive sin. And number three, only God can be worshipped. Psalm 81 said, let there be no strange God among you, nor shall you worship any foreign God. So you cannot worship any saint, you cannot worship any angel, no matter how great or majestic they are. We can only worship God as a believer. So this is very clear. Only God is our savior. Only God can forgive sin. And only God can be worshipped. Okay?
However, there is a very strange being in the Bible who is called the angel of the Lord. He's not a regular angel. He's very unique. And let me introduce who he is. So the Bible said, the angel of the Lord is our savior. Isaiah 63 said, and he become their savior in all their affliction. He was afflicted and angel of his presence saved them. So this angel, um, which called the angel of the Lord, is going to save the Israel people, save us. That is strange. I thought only God can save. But let's keep going. This angel of the Lord forgives sins. Exodus said, Behold, I send an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. Pay careful attention to him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgression. He's not going to forgive your sin if you don't obey for my name is in him. No angel can forgive sin. And God never said, this angel has my name. But there is, a once again, this particular being, this special being called the angel of the Lord. And God said, you, gotta, you better listen to this being. Uh, otherwise, if you rebel against him, he's not going to forgive your sin. And number three, son of man uh, is to be worshipped. Daniel chapter 7 said, I saw in the night vision, and behold, with the cloud of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and to him was given dominion and glory and, and a kingdom, that all people, nation, and language should serve him. And this word serve is uh, equivalent to worship. So who is this son of man that beside God we're going to worship? And guess what? What is the favorite title of Jesus for himself? He just always call himself son of man. So we could clearly see that there's a, this being called angel of the Lord or sometimes called son of man that's going to be a savior, that's going to save our sin, and that's going to be worshipped by all people, all nation, and all language. So once again, who is this angel of the Lord? It become more clear in the Exodus account. So who appeared to Moses in Exodus? Do you think God appeared to Moses? You're only half correct. Let's read who actually appeared to Moses in, in the Exodus. Uh, Exodus chapter 3 said, He led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to the Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of midst of bush. He looked and the, behold, a bush was burning and he was not consumed. But the, the Bible said this is the angel of the Lord, but God, the Bible also said this is God. God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not be, do not come near. Take your sandal off your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am uh, the God of your father, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. So once again, this is very strange. Who appeared to Moses? Angel of the Lord appeared to Moses. But Bible described that he is God. And and." He himself described, I am the God of your father. But guess what Jesus said in the New Testament? He said, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was even born, I am. And this is the same I am in the Exodus. Jesus claimed to be this angel of the Lord who appeared, who appeared before Moses. So it's clear that Jesus was even in the uh, Old Testament. And Jesus is the angel of the Lord that, that is described in the Bible. But where can we find all three uh, triune God in the Old Testament? Where can we find the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament? I'm going to show you a one Bible passage where it describes the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, even in the Old Testament. Okay? It's in Isaiah chapter uh, 63, 8 and 10. Let's read it uh, together. For he said, surely they are my people, children who will not deal falsely. And he become their savior. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. So when you break it down, there's a triumph God here. So let me break it down for you. So who's going to be the savior? The God. Father God's become their savior. But who is this God again? He's the angel who's going to save them. And then um, if they don't obey God, if you don't obey this being, then they're going to grieve his Holy Spirit. So there's a trinity in the Old Testament. 
Father God, the Son who's described as an angel of the Lord, and the Holy Spirit. So it's a misunderstanding that we as a Christian come up with the concept of Trinity in the Old Testament. It's not a made up uh, concept. Even from the Jewish Bible, the Hebrew Bible that we call Old Testament, God has revealed himself to as a tri triune being. So who is God the Father? He's the creator of all things. And he's the only one who, can, who we can worship. And he's going to judge the world when the end time comes. So that's our Father God, creator of all things, creator God. We should only worship God and he's going to judge the world. And then uh, he's a father of all. But who is the son? Same thing. Bible said he's a creator of things. In the last day, he was spoken to us by the son whom he appointed to the heir of all things through whom also he created the world. So the son created the world. And he's to be worshipped by all people as well. He said that um, let all God's angel worship him. And not even the angel. He said, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, all nation will come and worship you. So this is speaking to the son. So son is to be worshipped as well. And guess what? Son's going to judge the world. For the father judged no one, but he has given all judgment to the son. So once again, what I'm trying to say is they're not a separate being. Father, Son, and the Spirit are one God, but they have different roles. They have different person. And once again, who is Holy Spirit? He's a creator of all things, just like the Father, just like the Son. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. By the breath of Spirit his, of his mouth, all, all their hosts. So Holy Spirit created the world. And we are to worship our, our Holy, uh, worship Holy Spirit as God as well. For we are uh, the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. So once again, we are to worship God, uh, worship Holy Spirit as God. And Holy Spirit is going to empower us. Jesus said, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance that I have said to you. So what is the conclusion? How can we apply everything that we talk about, everything that we learn to, your, to our own life? What does it mean for God to be a triune God? And what does it have to do with us? Number one, we need to understand and know who, God, who we worship and love. So if you say you love somebody, you're going to do your best to get to know that person, right? You want to know what that person like, what that person's favorite uh, color, favorite food, favorite music. So if you say you worship God, if you say you, if you love God, then you need to truly understand and know who God is. And this is the key. The Trinity is the key to understanding who God is. So we worship triune God, who is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And number two, you need to understand their role to apply to your own life. Who is the Father? Father is the, the someone who loves you and sends his Son to save you. Who is, the, who is the son? Jesus is somebody who loves you and died for your sin on the cross. Who is the Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit loves you and he empowers you in your life. So by understanding this, their unique role in a triune God, you can apply to your own life. You pray to Father for, um, for thanking him for being a creator God and sending his only son Jesus to die for you. You pray to Jesus and thank him because he has saved you from your sin. And you pray to Holy Spirit to empower you so that he could send his gift uh, to you. And there are so many different uh, gifts of Holy Spirit that we could be empowered to uh, live according to uh, the word of God. So once again, um, Christian life depends on how much you understand who God is. So, um, we got to do our best to know God. And more we know who God is, uh, the better we get to apply uh, his commandment and his love in our life. And let me just tell you this one uh, fact, and then I'm going to conclude our message today. So there's a guy called St. Anselm of Canterbury. And he come up with this unique concept of God. He defined God as that then which nothing greater can be conceived. 
So more simply, this person said God is the greatest being that we could think of, we can conceive. So if you think of a person, let's say person number one, he um, only loves, let's say, um, um, 50. That's the amount of, of his love and the duration of his love. But if you, if you could think of somebody who can love more, let's say eternally, for eternally he could love, then obviously the second person is more greater, therefore he's God. Why am I saying this point? Because in God in other religion, even in other monistic religions such as uh, um, Jewish belief and Islam, their concept of God is somebody who is finite in love. Uh, here's a reason why. Uh, Jewish people still believe that God is only one being. It's not a triune God, but they also believe that God is eternal. But um, God only became loving when God created something because in order to love someone, something, you need to have a uh, object, right, to love. But eternally past, there is nothing else. There is only God. So eternally past, God has nothing to love. Therefore, he was not really a loving God. Only when he began to create something, maybe an angel, maybe a heaven and earth and human, he began to love them. So in their concept, in their mind, God for them has a finite love. What about in Christianity? Tri triune God of the Bible that we believe is a source of love from eternal past, even from an eternal past when there is nothing else but himself. God was always in love within the relationship of Trinity. Father God loved son. Son loved the father. Uh, father loved the spirit. Son loved the spirit. So within the unique relationship of tr Trinity, they always been in love. Therefore, we could confidently say that God is love. That is why John, uh, 1 John 4 8 said, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. This is the very key concept of who God is. In Luke 10, 27, Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strengths, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. So basically, only two things are given. It said, love God and love your neighbor, because this is the very identity of who God is. So here's my point. This is my conclusion. The more you understand who God is, the more, more you understand the tri nature of God, you begin to understand um, his, um, his commandment, why he gave us such a commandment to love God and love, nature, uh, love our neighbor. Because love is the, is the uh, central concept uh, of who he is. And more we get to understand God, me, more we get to uh, love him, and more we get to honor him, and more we get to uh, obey his commandment and live according to his will. So I bless everyone to fully know uh, and uh, get to know God. And remember, this is only a beginning. It's, it's going to take, take our lifetime to know God. But um, make every opportunity, uh, involve in every opportunity to get to know God. And by knowing who God is, I bless that everyone's going to abide in his love and let that love flow in you to love your neighbor, to live a life as a salt and light. Okay? Let's pray. Lord God, you are, we uh, confess you are awesome. You are a creator who have created everything on earth and on, in heaven. And you're also a father and you're also a son and you're also a spirit. Therefore, uh, we love you and we serve you. Help us um, obtain more knowledge of you and become more wise and become uh, more like you, Father God. More we know who you are. Uh, more we could apply your commandment in, in our life. So empower us, give us knowledge so that we, we may honor you and we may um, proclaim your love to other people. Use as your instrument to uh, further your kingdom. Bless our student as they uh, grow in knowledge and their stature. Uh, give them uh, knowledge of you to appreciate who you are. You are a loving God that who loves us so much to give your son and give your spirit to empower us and to save us. Once again, help us become your ambassador to proclaim this truth and love in the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
At this time, we will have responsive praise and offering. You can either mail your offering to the address provided, which is PO Box 2950, Chino Hills, California 91709, or you can complete it online through the website on the screen. Please select the offering to the Education Department. This time, after you make your offering, let's go ahead and um, pray to God in silence. Let's meditate who God is. Let's think about um, what we learned today and meditate on God's nature, God's his, his unique um, triune nature of God, and try to um, think about what that means to you. Let's pray together uh, and make an offering to God. Where the rich and vilest ones stand adopted through his blood. Oh, mount of grace, to thee we cling. From the Lord hath set us free, once and for all, on Calvary's hill. Love and justice shall Defeated by the Lamb We who once were slaves by birth Sons and daughters now we stand Oh, we stand In Christ we stand Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful day. In these hard times, we continue giving to you, repaying the blessings you have given us. Please continue to bless us, and I pray that everyone in this meeting have a wonderful rest of the week. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And next up for today's announcements. Friday night Bible study will be on the 12th at 8 p.m., and you can join through our website. Um, also, we will be having a game night on February 26th, which is a Friday. 
Um, please keep our church and leaders in prayer on resuming in-person services. And right after service, we will have Bible study through big groups in this call. Oh, I was gonna, um, <laughs> there it is. I was gonna actually wait for the drum roll and we go one by one, but I guess here it is. Here's a result for our logo contest. First place is Ryan Kim. Second place is Rebecca Jung. And third place is Tiffany Gay. But thank you so much for everyone who have participated and take your time to come up with our logo and submit to us. Uh, hopefully we could use your logo in, in other medium as well. But for now, the, this one, the one that's de designed by Ryan Kim, it's gonna be our official logo for our overflow ministry. So let's give big hand to Ryan. Good job, Ryan. Good job, Rebecca. Good job, Tiffany. Please join us in reciting the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs>